Hello, welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Perer. Today on the show, I have Justin Fitzpatrick, Chief Innovation Officer of Income Lab. Income Lab is an online platform that basically lets you do dynamic retirement planning, but essentially is a decumulation software that helps model out different scenarios and stress tests in any number of interesting ways to model out what the decumulation scenarios look like for investors. And with that, here's my interview with Justin. Justin, thanks for taking the time. Jason, thanks a lot for having me. My pleasure. So Justin Fitzpatrick of Income Lab, tell us about Income Lab. Yeah, so Income Lab is software that advisors use to create and monitor what we think of as realistic, but more importantly, dynamic retirement income plans. So in other words, income plans that include plans for change, plans for adjustment. So it's clear from research and maybe just even your intuition that retirement isn't static. You know, People don't make a plan and follow it to the letter until they die or run out of money. Clients don't fail in retirement, they adjust. But until Income Lab came along, advisors didn't really have a robust, scalable way to build dynamic plans uh, or to communicate them effectively, because that can be somewhat complex, or to automate the, the business processes that are involved in, in plan monitoring. So we're, we're laser-focused on retirement income planning. So we typically live alongside one of the widely used generalized financial planning systems. And we're there for when client relationships need to go deep on retirement, whether it's you know income and withdrawal sourcing, tax planning, spending decisions. Basically, if it's crucial for retirement, we're there. All right. So let's talk about the history. What led to the creation of Income Lab? So I'm, I'm an academic by training. I did a PhD at MIT, spent some time as a professor before getting into financial services. And that really got me interested in uh, the state of the art of retirement income planning research. Um, and there's a lot of great research out there, um, a lot from practitioners, a lot from academics. So my co-founder, Johnny Paulson, and I did a really deep dive on that research and discovered just a, a wide gulf between the best ideas out there and what an advisor could actually do and scale and deliver to clients. So we built Income Lab to bridge that gap. Most importantly, because we saw if, if that gap could be bridged, it had the potential to dramatically improve the, the lives of, of a lot of people, people like my parents, people who are um, retired or, or plan on retiring. You know, There's a lot of fear and anxiety uh, around retirement. But we found that kind of more realistic dynamic planning really improves not just the objective outcomes for people in retirement, that's obviously super important, but also kind of the subjective experiences of mm. clients in retirement. So we spent a long time doing research, both you know diving into the literature, talking with clients, talking with advisors. We launched a beta in kind of mid-2020, uh, right in the middle of... Uh, the initial COVID surge, so that was uh, that was an interesting time. But kind of, yeah, exactly. It was it was impeccable timing. But by kind of early to mid 2021, we had something uh, market ready, and then we've been growing since then. So I took a pretty good look at this when you first came out. Well, this was because I discovered you. And I got to say, I, I do think that you put together probably the best kind of niche vertical in this uh, software in this space. And really, this this makes a lot of sense. The general financial planning softwares are trying to deal with every idea or every issue under the sun, right? So it's the difference between going going wide versus going narrow. And when you go narrow, you can do a bunch of stuff that the general softwares can't. And that's exactly what you kind of focused on. So it makes a lot of sense. And, and of course, to tackle, you tackled what I will, I will always borrow Bill Sharp's saying on this is the dirtiest problem in all of the finance is the decumulation side. So talk to me about like, besides like, obvious table stake stuff. You know, you have the investments, you have the assets in there, you have the expenditure information in there, and you have the calculated taxation. How is it that your software, or what is your software doing that is different than everybody else's to kind of differentiate? Yeah. So like you said, we go really deep on everything that has an impact on retirement income, things that you can use to fund your spending in retirement, whether that's you know, consumption or taxes or, or, or whatever. So like you said, that's sort of table stakes, but it, it is really important to... One thing we do is we try to get away from rules of thumb, right? It really, this is an area where customized planning is just necessary. So there's no 4% distribution calculator on this? Okay, so that's not a thing? Okay, no. we're going to go along just fine. <laughs> no, uh, we, we don't send you a, a Staples uh, calculator and show you how to press times 0 0.04. But I think the bigger thing is that the framing and all the analysis behind plans changes from a success and failure view of retirement. So that kind of wily e. Coyote running off a cliff picture to one that is that is adjustment based. And that actually opens up a whole world of of great conversations for clients. So now it's clear 
that there's actually there's a decision to be made about the trade-off, for example, between standard of living and the risk that you might have to trim that standard of living down at some point. That's what risk really is in retirement is the chances that you'll have to tighten your belt. And there are some folks who'd say, I want to live a little, uh, you know, I'm young. If I have to pull back later, that's fine. Others who'd say, look, I've done well. I can afford to be very conservative, spend less and hope my have a higher chance that my advisor never has to give me bad news. So that's a big part of it. And then the with that is advisors can set basically guardrails, but guardrails that include everything, all the idiosyncrasies of a, of a household that say, hey, here are the points where we think it would be prudent to make an adjustment based on your profile. And advisors are actually told you know, what those points are. They can communicate them easily with their clients. They're dollar-based. So even though there's a lot of sophistication in the an- analysis, they can present it to the client in a in a really simple way, set expectations. And we found that part of it has, has been a, a, a huge success. Clients, they get that retirement is dynamic, that adjustment is normal. That's how they lived in their working years. It's not a surprise when it is also true in retirement. Absolutely. And all too often, the parlance around retirement accumulation planning and, and using standard Monte Carlo analysis is always like percentage of failure. Like what is the risk of failure? Right. And you had it right. Like the it's tighten their belt, spend less, whatever it is, adjust their expectations. So that is the first part. The Monte Carlo piece is is pretty common in in the invest in the financial planning software world. But the what does this actually mean or what does this actually translate into it is not something that's greatly addressed in a lot of softwares. That's something you guys really honed in on. Can you tell us all about how you did that? Yeah. So like you you were saying, I think a lot of people already were a little dissatisfied with that framing of of success and failure. Um, we talked with a lot of advisors who were already talking with clients about adjustments. The problem was they couldn't actually show a client when an adjustment would be made or paint a long term picture of what a life might look like if you adjust in this way. So we really honed in on helping advisors paint that picture. Thinking We, we think of it as like drawing them a map, right? We're going to be traveling through this landscape. Now we don't know exactly, right? It could be the maybe the higher path, maybe the lower path. Maybe we'll, there'll be a detour along the way, but the plan we have built is a plan that has change within it. So when events happen that, that draw retirees' attention, things like higher inflation or major market corrections, an advisor can say, look, this is actually part of the plan. The plan includes parameters telling us when it'll be time to to make a change. And the great thing is if you have a dynamic plan, at least historically, it looks like relatively minor adjustments could have you know, saved any plan uh, in the sense of stop people from running out of money. And so that that piece, that kind of the, the magnitude piece, I think is really missing from a success failure Monte Carlo approach, right? You say 90 success, 10 failure. Well, what do the failures look like? In a lot of cases, those aren't those aren't really failures. So that that kind of binary isn't very useful. Yeah. Too often when we hear failure, we think like, you know, you know would you get like simple as what you get on a plane if you had a 10% chance of failure? No, you wouldn't, right? It's it's all about context of what failure actually means in intention values. So that makes perfect sense. So you've done that more to the point. I think what's what's impressive with me, I think, is that you, you specifically state like, Hey, this is how much you'd have to drop by. And this is how much, you know, you basically have to spend less of every, every year or what percentage that equalizes. Uh, so you're, you're turning that, that information into actionable, like scenarios to explain what that looks like. And you know, the, the big debate online, I usually see about Monte Carlo versus not people saying, well, it's not perfect and it sucks for these reasons, but at least it's it's showing that it's not a deterministic outcome. You've gone one better as to show what the non-deterministic outcomes in- impact is. So, you know, well done in that regard. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, as you know, with, with technologies, I mean, nothing is ever perfect, right? But the, the move from deterministic algorithms, which are useful for certain things, mm-hmm. to more sophisticated modeling, and now to to kind of true dynamic planning. That's just all, all an evolution. And um, yeah, including the, the simulation modeling, the stochastic modeling, it's super important to understand risk, right? And, and that that was the major contribution of, of Monte Carlo when it got applied to financial services. Yeah. So let's talk about the way you are modeling the risk. Like you're using more than one method here. Can you speak to each of those? Yeah, so we give advisors a choice of, of, of how to do the modeling. And, and, and that modeling is really important in order to understand, you know, given this exact profile, right? I mean, and it could be quite complex, not just withdrawals, right? 
couple of social securities, maybe a pension, maybe a rental house, maybe that pension adjusts differently on one spouse's death, right? There's a lot of things that are really important to get right, but you can then apply various models of the world to, to the situation to, to see what, um, how your advice might change. So we do have, you know, traditional Monte Carlo where you're using the same uh, capital market assumptions for every period of the plan. We also have what we call regime-based Monte Carlo, which just allows you to have near-term assumptions and long-term assumptions. That solves a problem, which is that a lot of advisors would like at some periods to project lower returns in some asset class or maybe all asset classes. But if you apply that over 30, 40 years, that might be um, a little problematic. And then we also allow advisors to use uh, historical return sequences and probably most importantly, inflation sequences. Well, so we're really interested in the full risk picture. If you have a client, for example, who depends heavily on a pension that's not adjusted for inflation, our typical focus on you know the volatility of investment portfolio might not be the most important thing. Uh, your inflation assumptions might, and mm-hmm. and so we our system is sophisticated enough to take all that into account. Yeah, I mean that's you know one of the more impressive things I saw was that you're you're basically you know everybody's got kind of different goalposts for you know, their retirement scenario, right? Like the, the different things that are the more crucial pieces depending on their idiosyncratic needs. And you've kind of created enough flexibility within the system to basically let them kind of determine what the goalpost, let the advisor determine what the most important goalpost is in this regard. Yeah, that's right. So you can set kind of some spending goals, you can set legacy goals, and right, we're always trying to kind of balance all of those goals and help the advisors produce advice that kind of as much as possible hits that balance. You've also, and you know, this has been used in a bunch of stuff. Um, I mean, Derek Thorpe, who I believe is a consultant for you guys, has done that a bunch of writing on this. Kind of the visualizations you created around patterns of retirement income and patterns of retirement spending. I found those both insightful and also easy to understand for clients to show that too often the focus is on, you know, how much can this portfolio generate every year? So therefore I can like just consume that. Like, I don't know about you, but my client base doesn't doesn't work that way, right? Like yeah. they, they want to live their lifestyle. The sources of money are going to change over time. How do I explain that? Can you can you speak to that? Isn't? Yeah, that's that's really important. It's definitely the software is built so that if if a client really is just hey, kind of replace my paycheck or provide me a certain amount of income, then you can present the plan at that level. If you need to dive into okay, here's how it's going to be produced, uh, and maybe most importantly over time how that's going to change. Right, so we often see people. Uh, retire before they take Social Security. So there might be periods where a lot of their uh, lifestyle is funded by portfolio withdrawals. And then that might go down quite a bit when some other cash flows come in. So you're really able to kind of build that layer cake, present details to clients who need it, but but kind of step back as much as possible in other situations. Because I think you mentioned this, you know, retirement is one of the nastiest, hardest problems to deal with. There's so many unknowables and unknowns. So it's for somebody who loves analytics, you can really dive in, but it would be hopeless to try to present that to every client. So we've really tried hard to listen to our advisors, um, to listen to our consultants like Derek around, you know, how can we help advisors best present this in, in ways to clients where they're going to understand and follow the plan. And I think, yeah, like you said, I'm glad to hear the, the feedback that it's been successful. We're certainly not done. We'll, we'll continue refining as we learn more. Yeah. I mean, even simple things like the ability to toggle switch to go from real to nominal uh, numbers, right? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, the thing about the charts that often screws people up is they just always go up and to the right, at least they should. <laughs> and I think too often, you know, oftentimes all they'll tell clients, look, okay, so you die with this much money. Do not go spending it. That's roughly equivalent to today. It seems more realistic, but you have to get there, right? So, you know, being able to frame it is okay. So, you know, once I actually factor in inflation, guess what? It looks a lot more like a straight line across, or it's not yeah. as impressive. I think it's 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 far more easy for them to digest because, I mean, the human brain has a hard time processing compounding, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, inflation after 20 years, what do you mean I'm going to spend that kind of money? Well, that's just a 2% inflation rate. Well, it doesn't make any sense, right? So, you know, that's the kind of feedback you get. Talk to me about the, now you've allowed in the system, in the system them to basically advise us to create different scenarios and test out different scenarios. Talk to me about what tools you built in there to help them kind of come up with the quote unquote ideal 
scenario for their client. Yeah. So you're right. Scenario planning is, is built right in. So if you kind of think of the workflow, you have a prospect or a client where retirement is becoming maybe the core of the relationship. The first step is to find a plan that that works for them. So there's some there's some baseline things that every plan is going to contain, right? Maybe it's that pension or, or kind of the basics of social security, though not the claiming time. And then you can do A-B testing. So certainly things like when to retire, when to claim social security, but even more complex things like whether to self-insure for long-term care, all of that can be sort of you know compared side by side. And then you would choose a plan that we're actually going to follow. Um, and we call that implementing a plan, which really just means set it on kind of auto monitor. And now Income Lab will, as much as possible, bring in new data every month and rerun the plan, step you forward in time, right? So now you're getting a little closer to social security. Maybe your age has changed, so mortality assumptions are different. And then tap the advisor on the shoulder if that plan is calling for a change any month. So that's the that's the automation of the business processes, right? I mean, no one should be tracking, you know, CPI, uh, you know, inflation, household by household when they lasted an, assum- uh, an adjustment. That's great work for a computer, terrible for a human. So that's the kind of thing that we're we're trying to make this kind of service, long-term advice service, um, really scalable for a practice. So talk to me about beyond just the, the pretty charts that I really like. How about the deliverables that you help generate for, for advisors and how they can better, com- how you enable the communication of these principles and what's happening here to the client? So there again, it's up to the advisor to determine which will work best for a client. But there's a lot of views in, in the software from, again, very simple. Okay, here's the total income, right? Which might be made up of many things. Here's your portfolio balance and here's the guardrails. Here's when, you know, in the near term, we would make an adjustment. You can dive into much any as much detail as, as you want. Uh, so we have a, a full reporting center where each of those modules, each of those kind of think of them as about one page views. Some are more like half a page. And you can just put those together uh, in any kind of report template you want and deliver them to clients. A lot of advisors, of course, these days, whether it's virtual meetings or on a big uh, flat screen in their office, might might be using uh, more interactive tools. Um, a lot of the, the visuals uh, have a little more dynamic nature to them as you scroll over and zoom in and so on. So it just depends on the client. We have everything from kind of high level. So for example, we have a, you know, taxes are important in retirement, right? So one important decision people have to make is, how to source portfolio withdrawals. And, you know, in the United States, we have, I don't know, dozens probably of account types and each- Pretty close from the CFP <laughs> and materials that are being used. <laughs> yeah. So those are really complex calculations, but, you know, we have a view that just says, hey, let's compare two ways to do this. Here's some different statistics, how they differ. You know, your, your effective tax rate is lower. Okay, very high level, easy to understand, but you can dive then all the way into each- income type, how it layers up inside tax brackets and so on. So there's there's a lot of flexibility there to match the the client. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, frankly, I think one of the wonderful things you did about this is that so much of the UI is actually kind of the visual interface, right? Like that is, you know, I would think if I was American and I was using this, I can't use it in Canada, begrudgingly, I think I would be very comfortable opening this up in front of a client and and showing them the end result and walking them through. And, and you know, there's a lot of kind of very interesting kind of like visual tricks that you played into this besides like the real versus nominal switch. Like you have that one chart that shows how things have performed over history in with, with historical returns. And you can turn or on or off the indicator that indicates when recessions happen, right? So mm-hmm. it's a nice little trick to basically say, oh yeah, but we're going into recession. Well, click here's all the recessions this would have gone into in the past. You tell me what you think now, right? So there's a lot of, I think it was, uh, I feel like you guys looked at this not just as a advisor to at least in your design, but also something that everybody can feel comfortable with putting in front of a client if need be. Yep, that's exactly right. Again, it's that that challenge of taking the complex and 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 making it simple, which is great for clients. I mean, frankly, it's it's great for advisors and researchers too, right? Kind of the 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 so what that we really need to to take away from things. Absolutely. Right. I mean, it's um, congratulations, your plan has got a 95% chance of success, but you know, so what about the five? Well, that means worst case, you know, historically worst case scenario, you spend this much less. Like that is so much more digestible to people than anything else uh, I've seen. So, so kudos for just that function alone. 
Just on that on that point, also, and you had mentioned Derek earlier. There's an added benefit. So he did some research. I think it was with Michael Kitsis on kind of how investors or how how clients their reaction to plans that are presented in exactly what you just said, sort of the 95 percent success, five percent yeah. failure versus the adjustment framing. And they found much higher levels of kind of trust and credibility in their advisor. We could speculate on why exactly that is, but um, there's something about presenting life as containing adjustments as being you know a little bit dynamic and fluid that that really rings true and then that also sets clients up to expect a call from an advisor at some point with an adjustment so we didn't know that that would be the research result but of course we were gratified to learn that it was but I, I think that's a that's a big takeaway no I think it makes perfect sense right I think you know we're humanizing this very the implications of this potentially foreseen, it seems like seen as a negative piece of news. Like if you're fortunate enough that your Monte Carlo score is hundred percent every time they go and do it, great. Like you got, you tell clients they got next to nothing to worry about, at least in that regard. But if you're someone who's like, okay, so I, I'm not, I'm, you're, you're telling me I'm not at hundred. So something's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But simply being able to frame it in human terms, it just makes it so much more digestible to say, oh, okay. So if I, so if it doesn't go according to plan, then I need to reduce my spending by $200 a month. Okay, I, I think I could do that. Like, it's just, it makes it so much more human than, yeah. than just the numbers of it. Yeah, there's a big effect of framing and metaphors here that I think sometimes we we ignore, but even just the words success and failure, you mentioned often, you actually will see comparisons to, to plane crashes. I think that's just a terrible metaphor for for retirement. It's probably more like um, traffic jam in most realistic situations. So I think even just just doing that, we focus a lot now. I mean, we love the analytics, but what is the client experience of of working with their advisor on a plan? Is it anxiety producing or is it hope producing? And right. we found that for the vast majority, if not, I mean, the overwhelming number of clients, there's actually a lot of hope, and and that kind of upside is usually missing in other ways of, of viewing retirement. So the example you just had where, okay, this is a plan where, you know, they had hundred percent success, the market tanked, they still have hundred percent success, right? Wow. That means they were being incredibly uh, conservative. Income lab will actually, it'll, it'll let you put a guardrail that essentially says, Hey, look, it's belt and suspenders at this point. You could spend more. Now they might yeah. decide not to spend more, right? But it's at least an opportunity to talk. Maybe it's talking about Legacy planning, other opportunities, right? right. There, there's a, there's a, there's something to talk about here. There's some value to add. Yeah, you tell someone who's been frugal and saved their entire lives that they can, you know, spend three thousand dollars a month more than they were planning on. They may say, "Well, I'm not going to do that and not just do that." But they may also start thinking about the next time that their kid basically says they need something to help, or they they might think about their the sports that their grandchildren are playing or something of the sort. So, you know, that takes it back to much more, you know, what are you going to do with this um, mm -hmm. conversation? I also, I mean, one interesting uh, aspect too of your, of your expenditure situation uh, sec this section is that, you know, you have your baseline expenses. So you kind of basically create this scenario whereby, okay, here's what I absolutely need to live on. But then you got this variable, one, which I think is basically hugely valuable because I mean, not only is it, are these things happening, maybe was one offs, but maybe that is the discretionary spending, right? Maybe that is the stuff where, okay, this is me taking more vacations than I probably should for the next little while, or, or, you know, eating out every, every second day, whatever it might be, but being able to frame, I mean, being able to build scenarios where I can frame around, Hey, this is what it takes to live the basic lifestyle. This is the variable, which you have discretion over and being able to test for both of those, again, usually valuable because the conversation that comes up about, you know, how big a retirement life are you living? Yeah, that piece, it's a little bit of a catch-all, but it definitely includes sort of these what ifs, right? So a, a client yeah. calls up and says, hey, you know, we're thinking of buying this vacation house or going on this big yeah. trip or something like that. It's very easy to, again, with scenario planning, just make a copy. So it's going to be exactly the same, except I'm going to add that trip. Okay, well, how does that affect my kind of baseline spending now that's available to me over, over the rest of my life? And people are often surprised by how little it would. Now it, it will, right? If it's big enough, but you might say, well, you know, if you could you handle 200 bucks less, to, less a month in exchange for taking a trip around the world? Yeah, maybe I could. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yep. So, I mean... This has been wonderful. I'm going to wrap up with the, the big three questions I ask everybody to end on a positive note. So first one I have for you is, 
if you had one wish for something to change in your product or your product company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Yeah, I think probably kind of the, the industry or the culture around retirement needs needs less negativity. I think it needs, mm-hmm. you know, kind of less catastrophizing. Retirement is this special thing that by its nature actually gives retirees a lot of power, a lot of power to manage risk. So if we could help people understand that they're not a hedge fund, they are a totally different animal, I think that would be that would be really big. And if I get two, I would say the other is less dependence on rules of thumb, which we we already talked about. You know, people need individualized planning. Do not get me started on rules of thumb. <laughs> anyway, the uh, but I, I agree with you. And also we have to think in the context of this is retirement itself as a concept is so new to human society as, a, as in general. Like mm-hmm. in, in, in all honesty, we should be celebrating the fact that society's gotten to the point where we can live beyond base level needs and live well into our later, later and later years and basically do so with potentially with, with financial stability. And uh, you're right. You know, I think the negativity on some level is warranted because people need to be alert and concerned that this is something they have to take out. They can't take for granted that this is going to happen. They have to take action. But I think we we do get too lost sometimes in that. And it's, um, it is it's problematic. The second question for you is what's been the biggest challenging in the company to where it is today. Wow. I mean, as you, you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, as, as you know, the challenges are just probably too numerous to list or thankfully even to remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say the biggest you challenge- You block them out from pain. I mean. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge is probably, at least for me personally, patience. So when you kind of have this idea, you want it out and scaled yesterday. And of course, speed is is our friend, right? But I think building the team- and we have an amazing team, you know, scaling the product. It's been a lot harder and taken longer than we initially thought. And I'd say we're we're very nimble, as you know, a lot of software startups are. So turning a huge boat, I, it, it makes me understand now how gigantic organizations have have uh, trouble changing. So I think, yeah, just just patience and scaling. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> scaling is is a real challenge. That's for sure. No matter whether it's been going from from one to two, or from you know going uh, even a five percent increment, you to a certain size can be big. And then the last question I have for you is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on every and keeps you fighting a good fight to, you know, that is entrepreneurship every day. I would say we would never have started this, this company, built this software if it didn't have the opportunity to have a huge positive impact. So we're convinced that if more people can get kind of more reality-based customized, you know, a, a adjustment-based plans and follow them having a guide along the way. Many, maybe most people <laughs> would be better off than they think. They can live a, a life with a lot less worry. So that like this, we really feel this is not just an opportunity, but sort of a responsibility. And that is, mm-hmm. that keeps us going as founders. It keeps our team going. Speaking of which, I mean, working with an amazing group of people, just the the people who have been attracted to this venture and left great jobs to come and and build it with us. Um, it's just it's just great to work with great people, and also the advisors that we've we've attracted um, into this community. I mean, working with great professionals doing great work for clients, it's really heartening. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm on a couple of advisory boards for various tools, and it's always it's, it's stimulating to be involved in that part of the process. So I totally get it from the other side of the uh, of the aisle there. So uh, Justin, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate what uh, you taking the time, and I would encourage anyone who's looking for retirement accumulation software and helping modeling that for their clients, take the time to check out Income Lab. Thank you, Jason. Thanks a lot for having me on. So that was today's episode of FinTech Impact. I hope you enjoyed it as always. And if you did, please review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.